Hello everyone, I'm Luke and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be bringing you a sort of bulk video movie review of the films that I saw between the months of March and uh, the end of May. As I talked about in my update video that I posted yesterday, there will be a link in the description if you didn't get the chance to see it. Um, I'm basically not only going to play catch up with the content that I missed out on over those uh, three months, but, well, I already talked about it. I'm, I'm moving, there's changes, I'm not leaving the channel, obviously, but things are happening. And I wanted to dedicate one video to the films that I did see over the course of the end of February uh, and going into May. I'm going to be posting a review separately for Solo, uh, which I am seeing this weekend, so just stay tuned uh, for that one. But that's going to be in its own separate video. But as for these films, so uh, right before the Oscars, I managed to see two of the big contenders. And the first one was The Darkest Hour, which is essentially the story of the first three weeks of Winston Churchill um, when he becomes prime minister. Um, right, obviously, after the beginning of... The Second World War. And it was so interesting because Dunkirk came out in July of 2017, and then this movie comes out for the Oscar season, and they almost feel like they should be companion pieces. It's almost like one complements the other and vice versa. Um, Dunkirk is the human condition about the soldiers actually on the beaches, whereas this is more of the... Um, uh, behind the scenes, um, what happened politically, and obviously, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm drawing it, Gary Oldman, I almost drew a blank on his name, uh, obviously uh, front and center as Winston Churchill, who won the Oscar for Best Actor, and he was completely deserving of it. This movie rides entirely on his performance. It's a very it's not for everybody. This is definitely a film if you are someone who wants to either study history or wants to study film, then I recommend watching this movie because it really is uh, a great little gem in, uh, in our history that not a lot of people know about. And I always appreciate movies that put untold stories from actual history front and center in a, in a movie format for everybody to be able to see and enjoy. The other Oscar contender I saw was Phantom Thread, which was Daniel Day-Lewis's farewell performance to cinema, and at least that's what it was billed as. And I have to tell you, I walked out of that film, I walked out of the theater really disliking the movie, intensely disliking the movie. But after sitting on it for a couple of days, I slowly started thinking about it more and more, and I thought to myself about all the things that frustrated me were not actually, like, legitimate reasons to get mad at the movie. I mean, I will, I will admit, I, I thought the movie, when I was watching it, was incredibly dull and pretentious, and it felt long and convoluted, but it is minimalist. I, I've never seen a movie quite like Phantom Thread before and I've never and I had never seen anything from that director so I didn't know that his style is very minimalist in its direction in the way that the actors are directed in the way that their dialogue is presented so having it be so much more in it you can't view Phantom Thread on a surface level otherwise you'll think it's really boring like I did when you dig deeper, that's when you find the genius of that movie. Now, there is a really, really fine line that the movie walks in terms of its ethical uh, problem at the end of the third act of the movie, um, but it's not nearly as bad as Passengers. I still loathe and despise that film for basically being a rape allegory, but this movie is... This movie's uh, third act dilemma that happens involves two our two lead characters essentially in a very difficult position in their relationship and um, it just goes to show you how far people will go to control the people in their life and to have someone just to be there to want them. So 
in the end, if I had made the review right after I saw it, I would have destroyed this movie. But after actually seeing it and sitting on it and dissecting it afterwards, I was able to see that there are genius elements in Phantom Thread. So give it a rental if you are someone who, especially, I say see it for the costume design alone. I mean, the weird thing about it is that the costume design was very beautiful, but the actual clothes looked very cheap and poorly made on camera. It was weird. I have a love-hate relationship with this movie. I respect the film. I'm just not 100% in love with it. Then, I saw A Wrinkle in Time. Now, I have to tell you, I was very excited for this movie. This was on my most anticipated list for the year, for 2018. And oh my lord, was I so disappointed. I hated this movie. And the reason why is because I felt bad for the movie. I felt bad for the director, for the screenwriter, for the stars, because this movie was trying so hard to be good. And that is the perfect way to make something terrible. And ultimately, this film pitches itself as a movie about science and string theory and interdimensional um, study. And that is fantastic. But the problem is, is that they then try to add magic into science. And that's when the movie completely falls apart. You cannot have actual scientific theory that you're trying to rationalize mixed in with literal magic and supernatural uh, entities and places that do not exist. Also, the, the cast was phenomenal. Everybody in the cast is so brilliant. But the movie completely falls apart in not only the unfocused direction from Ava DuVernay, but a terrible screenplay by Jennifer Lee. And this is 0 for 2 with her, in my opinion, because I thought that the weakest part of Frozen was, in fact, the screenplay. Um, five years later, and I still think that that movie is not nearly as genius as everybody made it out to be. And A Wrinkle in Time really suffers from the fact that everybody wanted to make this a really great movie and operate on so many different levels, making it a science movie, making it a girl power movie, making it an adventure movie, and nothing came together. So you literally just have a hodgepodge of basically talented actors literally phoning it in as they try to go along. So that was a big problem. Then, I actually couldn't believe I saw this movie, but I caught a matinee of Peter Rabbit one day. I, was, I had the day off from work, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go to the movies. And I saw Peter Rabbit, and I have to tell you, it was very charming. But that's all the movie has going for it. Uh, the voiceover talent is fantastic for all the CGI hybrid animated characters, and Rose Byrne and Donald Gleason actually do a fantastic job as the two leading human characters. But it was just, it was a goofy children's movie. And I couldn't believe that the number, I was the only, I was the single adult that was seeing the film, and then everybody else was parents with their small children. And, but what do you expect? But then, these last three movies are fantastic, and I can't wait to talk about them. So the first movie, I saw A Quiet Place, and I adored this movie. I, when I first saw the trailers for it months ago, back in October of last year, when the trailers were making the rounds for this movie, I was like, mm -mm, nope, hard pass. Do not want to watch a horror movie. But then I had, as I mentioned on this channel, I had surgery back in January. So I was laid up on bed rest for six weeks. And one of the movies that I decided to watch when my friends came over to keep me company was It. I had heard nothing but glowing reviews about It, and I'm going to do a separate video talking about it because I enjoyed that film so much. But after watching It, I was able to appreciate it on an artistic and very intellectual level and not view it as a simple jump scare movie. So with a new love of sophisticated horror films, I decided to watch A Quiet Place, and I am so happy that I saw this movie with a packed house, but you could have dropped a pin in that theater. Everybody was so silent, nobody said anything. It was kind of awkward to be able to eat popcorn and drink and have candy while you're watching a, basically a silent movie. 
and it was so, so good. I can't stress how fantastic A Quiet Place is. John Krasinski's directorial debut is fantastic, and I hope he gets so much good work out of this. And his wife, his real, his IRL wife, Emily Blunt, was amazing in this movie, too. Can't wait for Mary Poppins this December. Then I got to see Wes Anderson's Isle of Dogs. This was fantastic. I very much enjoy Wes Anderson. The only two movies that I have seen of his work, however, is Fantastic Mr. Fox and The Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, but I've heard that he has a very extensive and fantastic resume, and I'm going to check out his work. Um, same with how, after I saw The Shape of Water, I then in explored all of Guillermo del Toro's movies. Still think The Shape of Water is his best. But Isle of Dogs is fantastic. It's a stop-motion animated film. Um, and I gotta tell you, it was, cl it was classic Wes Anderson in the sense that it's quirky dialogue, it's characters that stare directly into the camera, it's very centered, it's very particular, it's got a huge star-studded voice cast, and it was so, it was, it was a joy ride to watch. It had twists and turns that I did not see coming, and there was so much heart. There was so much heart. It was very political. Um, I'm not going to lie to you, it is a very political heavy movie, but I don't think it's layered on so heavy that it would repel anybody. I think that if you watched the movie, you would obviously form your own opinions on what side you felt on, or how much of a connection this made to real life, but Isle of Dogs is a really, really good film. And honestly, I think that the Academy should seriously consider this for this upcoming year's Best Animated Feature. I think that Wes Anderson deserves an Oscar for his stop-motion work. And considering the fact that there are not a lot of high-caliber quality animated movies that will be coming out this year, I mean, I don't know how good The Incredibles and Wreck-It Ralph 2 and um, how the, the Grinch movie that uh, Illumination Entertainment is doing in terms of their quality, but in terms of in terms of quality and artistry and such a well-written and well-crafted film, top to bottom, I really, really loved Isle of Dogs. It was so excellent. And then, of course, the big movie of the year that everybody's been talking about since the end of April is Avengers Infinity War. I saw it opening weekend with a sold-out crowd, and oh dear lord was I floored by this movie. Now, I do have one legitimate big problem with this movie, and that is that this movie is incomplete. There is no third act in this film. The movie ends on... So, if you, if you are not... In, if you don't know this, a traditional, mo a traditional movie is made with a three-act structure which is essentially the story beats rise and fall over the course of three acts. And usually, the end of the second act is where the characters are at their lowest point. It's where, in romantic comedies, it's the, it's the, the breakup that happens. In uh, superhero movies, they've been beaten down to their lowest point. And in this film, very much so, there is a point in the film where we get to such a low point where I'm not joking you. I'm sorry, there's something in my eye. Um... I'm not joking, half of the cast is dead. I'm not joking. Half of the cast of this huge ensemble production, of this cast of, of Avengers Infinity War, are dead by the end of the movie. And that's how the film ends. So, essentially, the Russo brothers have presented us with a three-hour, two-act movie that ends on the low point, and we have to wait a full entire year before we actually get the resolution to what happened in Infinity War. So, when people thought that this was going to be the end of the cinematic universe, it was going to be the end of certain characters' runs, the way that it actually ended, we don't have a completed movie. Marvel usually wraps their films up in a bow by the end of it. Sometimes there are repercussions that will expand into other films, but this is the first time that they've ever made a movie and did not complete it for the sake of leaving you with a cliffhanger so big that you have no choice but to come back next year for Infinity War Part 2. 
And finally, um, I forgot to add this to my list, but I just remembered it. Last week, I saw Deadpool 2. Now, I reviewed that film when it came out back in 2016. It was one of my early uh, reviews on my other movie uh, channel, on my other movie review channel. And I had a great time watching the first one, but I seriously was kind of taken back at just how overt and offensive and grotesque some of the jokes and violence and humor were. But at, but two years after that and re-watching the first Deadpool, I saw all the genius in it. And But that's who the character is. That's who the character was on the page. That's who the character is on screen. And very rarely do uh, comic book characters get a perfect translation from page to screen. I mean, Marvel has been making movies for 10 years, but they've changed so much of the material in an in adaptation. And Deadpool, I feel, is one of the most faithful adaptations of a comic book character in capturing what they are like. And the second movie is just as smart, just as sharply written, and just as funny as the first movie, but it dials it up to a 15. There's so much more added humor. There's so much more... Um, sharper humor, and it's still violent, it's still cuckoo banana crazy, but it's really, really good. I, I, even, I even think, obviously in this day and age, if you're going to make a sequel and build on a franchise, you need to expand and rise to the occasion and improve, not improve upon, but elevate the material with each new installment. And I feel that in translation from the first Deadpool to the second one, it, it just, it, it hit the bullseye. It was so, so good. So those are the movies that I saw between March and May. Um, as I said, I'm going to be doing a review by itself for Solo, which I am seeing this weekend. Um, expect the film dissection of It coming soon. Um, watch the update video if you haven't. More content coming. Follow me on social media. Instagram and Twitter are in the description down below. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.